so here, uh, k is going to be different than the number of arms that we use. Uh, so hi, I'm Max. I'm giving a talk called Best of K Bandits. Uh, so in this talk, n is going to refer to the number of simple arms, and k is going to refer to a subset of arms that we're going to try to find. So imagine that I'm an ice cream store. Maybe I'm Baskin Robbins. I have 200 flavors I can carry. And I want to find the best 31 flavors to stock in the store. Uh, so um, how do I do that? And how do I use sort of uh, bandit, fixed budget, uh, kind of learning principles to do that in the optimal way? Uh, so formally, I'm going to have n simple arms, a subset of size k, and I'm going to have a, a binary measure over all the arms. Uh, this measure can be correlated, which is going to introduce some difficulties. And at each round, I'm going to pick, say, a subset of k ice cream flavors to put in my store, and nature is going to give me a customer drawn from you, and such that uh, the, the, the customer either likes or dislikes each flavor, and, my, uh, and then I'm going to receive some feedback. So I'm either going to see whether or not the customer purchased something, that would be the bandit feedback, whether or not uh, I'm to see the, the one flavor that the customer per, uh, purchased, that we'll call that marked bandit feedback. And finally, semi-bandit feedback is going to, we'd, we'd maybe ask the customer a survey and they would give us every flavor that they liked or they didn't like. Um, and our goal is to identify the uh, subset of flavors which we would stock, which would maximize the probability that a customer is satisfied or equivalently maximize this expectation. Uh, so what's the difficulty with this problem? Uh, the arms can actually be correlated in such a way that the optimal set might not be the arms of the highest means. So I'll walk you guys through a very simple example. Suppose half of people like chocolate and half of people like vanilla, uh, but now three quarters of people like strawberry. So if liking strawberry is independent of chocolate and vanilla, then you'll find that seven-eighths of customers are happy if you stock strawberry in another flavor. But you know, if, if you exclusively like vanilla or chocolate, then you can appeal to every customer by, by, uh, by stocking both, even though these are the lowest arm means. There are also some substantial computational difficulties. Uh, it turns out this problem is actually an online submodular optimization problem. There are computational lower bounds and wonderful work by Golovin, Streeter, and Krause, which deal with that. But in this talk, I'm really more interested in the statistical implications of this problem. Uh, so unfortunately, this problem in the worst case is very hard. Uh, so our informal theorem is that you need to look at all n choose k arms. And briefly, the way you do it is you take all arms to have the same mean. Uh, mu, um, you make the last arms k plus 1 through n independent of absolutely everything. Then you take the first k 1 through k arms and you make them k minus 1 wise independent. So every subset of size k minus 1 will be independent. And this implies that every subset of arms other than arms 1 through k of size k are going to be in totally independent. Finally, what you're going to do is you're going to couple the first arms 1 through k so that they are dependent and they have a slightly higher expected max than you would assume for independent arms. And then, you know, lastly, you're just going to shuffle everything so you don't know which the dependent set is. And then you'll find that every subset of arms except the best one are, are identical and you gain no information. Um, you, actually, we care about bounds that depend on gaps. Uh, I don't want to go through the, the most general theorem that we have, but we have one that just says that for, um, we can always construct a distribution that if the gap is sufficiently small, we get this sort of n choose k inverse gap squared that we would see. And uh, in semi-bandits, we also have to look at all n choose k, but we get this extra exponential factor, um, which uh, kind of comes from the fact that if you can see all the arms at once, you can more easily tell if they're correlated. And we have, we sketch for certain instances an upper bound that would actually be able to use sort of the parity of the distributions to t detect a correlation more efficiently in semi-bandits. Um, and why is this depressing? So it shows that actually, even if you have access to unlimited computation, uh, even if yeah, um, this would match, uh, say, naive upper bounds that you would obtain by treating each k subset as an independent subset of arms, and also, um, yeah, this would also translate into regret bounds. Uh, so, uh, so the worst kind of the worst case sort of regret bounds that you would see if there were there was no structure in the problem. Um, but there is something that's kind of fascinating, which is that these lower bounds that we proved require these exponentially small gaps, and that should leave us all very suspicious. Uh, and the reason is that this is actually unavoidable because of our construction. So what we found is, what we were able to do is we were able to characterize um, uh, distributions of k arms, which are k minus one wise independent and share the same marginal distributions. Uh, so um, formally, we were able to show that if they have the same marginal and they're k minus one wise independent, then their, their joint distribution is uniquely determined by this quantity we care about, uh, this expectation of their max. And this expectation of their max will be exponentially close to the max of independent arms. And actually, depending on what their each arm's mean is, it can be even smaller than that. Um, and the, the, the proof is kind of technical. It, it relies on uh, representing uh, distributions as a linear program. And we try to optimize this. And you can exploit a lot of symmetry in the LP. And you find out uh, 
this is sort of what the actual theorem looks like. It's kind of, I don't have enough time to go through it, but uh, you get a really absolutely tight characterization of what the, this kind of construction can provide. Uh, so there, this has some implications and, or things that we could speculate from it. The first thing is kind of obvious lower order moments constrain higher order moments. Think if you have an unpopular ice cream flavor and you have two of them, there's no way to couple them so that they're together wildly very popular and gonna appeal to everybody. Uh, said another way, good sets might be detectable for low, from lower order moments. So uh, you might find that if you have a lot of ice cream flavors that are immensely popular, they might be in favorable instances um, likely to be in the top set, and so you can use an optimistic algorithm which could rule out brute force search by appealing to lower order moments. Uh, finally, we consider, we had some upper bounds for independent measures. Um, these rely crucially on Bernoulli rewards. In this case, independent Bernoulli arms, uh, for independent Bernoulli arms, the best of K is precisely the top K. Turns out if the arms are independent but not Bernoulli, that's completely wrong. Um, so we need this Bernoulli property. Uh, the algorithm actually is a lot more complicated than one would expect due to information occlusion. So the idea is that if I play, um, uh, if I have bandit feedback and I give you a subset of arms, even if they're all independent, it's difficult to tell which arm in that, in that subset I've, I've played is responsible for either a reward or a loss. Um, so we actually get, are able to have upper bounds that depend on this information occlusion term for all the cases. Uh, we note semi-bandits is actually a very simple adaptation of top K not so hard, and we have nearly matching lower, uh, lower bounds, which also take this information occlusion into account. Uh, and that's the talk. Thank you.